And joining us now on the debate in Washington, D.C., David Frum, editor at FrumForum.com. In New York, New York, Jonathan Alter, columnist at Newsweek and the author of The Promise. In our nation's capital, John Ibbotson, Ottawa bureau chief with The Globe and Mail. And here in studio, Sylvia Bashevkin, political science professor and principal at University College, U of T, and John Duffy, founder of Strategy Corp, government relations firm. Good to have everybody, uh, both here in the studio, our new studio, new digs, and uh, in points beyond on the line. We're going to take a look at whether there actually is any room for intellectuals in public life these days, uh, given the way that the Tea Party has blasted uh, onto the horizon, and given who is in first place in the polls in the mayor's race in this city right now. Jonathan Alter, I want to start with you with apologies to everybody else. Sit tight for a few minutes because um, you wrote this book, The Promise, that I read over the summer. It's just a terrific book in which you draw a picture of Barack Obama as a man who deeply believes in the power of rational discussion arriving at the best possible solutions, which seems to be antithetical to everything you hear about public life today. Is that the mark of his intellect? Well, um, I think it's either the mark of his greatness, potentially, or his utter failure in the presidency. And we don't know which it is yet. Uh, you know, these polls go up and down. Right now, he's below 50 percent, uh, but not that much below 50. And, and he's about where Ronald Reagan was at a similar time in his term. So it's too soon to make definitive judgments uh, about folks. But I think that where he does have a problem is that he actually too often believes that you can get to the so-called right answer, quote unquote, and that you can apply uh, reason in politics and that will ultimately prevail. So I think the thing that he said recently that was maybe the most disturbing to me of, of everything he said was on, in a television interview, he said, this is not theater, talking about the presidency. The presidency has always been and always will be at least partly theater. Now, is a smart actor uh, better than uh, a less smart actor? Yes, but I think we know from long experience uh, watching politics in Canada and the United States that there is no direct correlation between brains and success in politics. Understood. Now, one of the things I learned from your book was that despite all of his senior most advisors telling him not to do it, he wanted health care. He wanted to achieve it in his first term. He thought, I'd rather have one good, strong term than two mediocre terms. And he went for it. So beyond being what you might consider a rational man, a man of intellect, can you also say he's a man of action and judgment? Oh, there's no question that he's a man of action. You know, one of the most erroneous things ever said about him uh, was by John McCain when he said he was all talk, 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 talk. Uh, Obama is very much about getting things done, uh, putting points on the board, to use a sports metaphor um, that he favors. I do think generally he does have good judgment, uh, not perfect, but good. And I think in that case, he made the right decision. I asked him when I interviewed him in the Oval Office in 2009, you know, why did you go ahead and do health care over the objections of Rahm Emanuel, his chief of staff, who told me, quote, I begged the president not to do this many leaders on Capitol Hill. Joe Biden, his vice president, told him not to do it. So I said, so why'd you do it, Mr. President? And he said, well, if I didn't do it now, it wouldn't have happened. Uh, so he realized you have to use your political capital or you lose it. That is not a head in the clouds, philosopher king kind of approach. It's a hard headed uh, uh, approach, even if you think it was the wrong one in this case. I don't. I think he made the right decision. Uh, it's not as if the economy would be in any uh, better shape if, if he hadn't done health care. Uh, and politically, he might have been in better shape in the midterms. Um, but what is power for if not to get certain things done? And that was a very big one. It's, it was the biggest piece of social legislation in 45 years in the United States since we first put in Medicare for the, the elderly and Medicaid for the poor in 1965. And Jonathan, let me do one more question with you before we get everybody else into this as well. And uh, it, it may be a bit cheeky of me to be quoting somebody else's book to you in asking you to answer this, but it's the president's book. I'm going to quote from The Audacity of Hope. And there's some, uh, you know, there's some, uh, some foul language in this, but uh, this is what the president wrote before he was president. Here we go. Maybe the critics are right. Maybe there's no escaping our great political divide. An endless clash of armies and any attempts to alter the rules of engagement are futile. We paint our faces red or blue and cheer our side and boo their side. 
And if it takes a late hit or a cheap shot to beat the other team, so be it, for winning is all that matters. But I don't think so. They are out there, I think to myself, those ordinary citizens who have grown up in the midst of all the political and cultural battles, but who have found a way to make peace with their neighbors and themselves. I imagine the white southerner who grows up hearing or growed up heard his dad talk about niggers this and niggers that, but who has struck up a friendship with the black guys at the office and is trying to teach his son different, who thinks discrimination is wrong but doesn't see why a son of a black doctor should get admitted into law school ahead of his own son. There is the middle-aged feminist who still mourns her abortion and the Christian woman who paid for her teenager's abortion. I imagine that they are waiting for politics with the maturity to balance idealism and realism to distinguish between what can and cannot be compromised to admit the possibility that the other side might sometimes have a point. Having said all of that, Jonathan, his vision of a purple America rather than blue state, red right. state America has not transpired yet. Fair to say? Absolutely. You know, the very first uh, story I ever wrote about Barack Obama in 2004, before he was sworn into the United States Senate, it was the very first cover story on him in any magazine. It was called the cover line was "Seeing Purple," and this is has been uh, his biggest failure as president, in my judgment, and it's not entirely his fault. And that is that we have not been able to transcend uh, these partisan divides. It might have been naive for him to think that we ever could, um, but he believes, uh, as his favorite president, Abraham Lincoln, said, that we need to appeal to what Lincoln called the better angels of our nature. And you will see, while he takes some partisan shots this fall, you will see him continuing to try to tack toward the middle and to try to stay above the fray, at least to some extent. He doesn't think he wins if he gets down in the muck uh, with everybody yelling on cable TV. So uh, he made a bet that he could transform our politics in 2009. He lost that bet, though he got a lot of other things done. Um, we'll see whether uh, that, uh, to use Richard Nixon's term, that silent majority that he's talking about of reasonable people uh, will reassert itself. You know, he got 54 percent of the vote in 2008. That was the biggest victory in 20 years uh, in American politics. Uh, it, it wasn't an overwhelming victory, but it was a very substantial one. And those people that he talked about in his book are out there. Uh, they're frustrated. Many of them are disappointed in him right now, but he has not lost them uh, permanently, so I wouldn't uh, underestimate Barack Obama. Okay, let's get everybody else into this. David Frum, come on in here if you would. Was the desire to have Americans seeing themselves outside of strict ideological boundaries, in your view, a misguided idealization of what Americans were capable of? See, may I answer your fundamental question here with, with a joke? Um, I don't want to lower the tone. <laughs> uh <laughs> oh, we'd love to have heard the joke, but we just lost your line. Okay, we're going to try and reestablish connection to Washington, and then we're going to get the joke, because we need the joke. Uh, Ibbotson, come on in here and you tell me. Let me put the same question to you. Do you think there was this misguided idealization about Amer what America was capable of? And I have no jokes to offer on this, <laughs> but um, the problem that Barack Obama faces is, is partly commercial and partly generational. Commercial in that an industry has, ar has arisen <coughs> that makes its money by convincing people to buy product based on ideology, whether it's Fox News or MSNBC, uh, you have this, this, these tremendous drive, this tremendous drive to polarize the argument and to demonize the opponent. In such a, uh, a media environment, it's impossible for anyone uh, to, to, to speak with, with reason and, and to put together the kind of pragmatic solutions, the kind of non-ideological bargaining on which um, the, the entire American system is premised. I mean, here in Canada, we have a parliament. There's supposed to be uh, an opposition party that opposes the government, but the Congress is all about compromise. It was d designed by the founders uh, for compromise. Uh, yet, at the moment, we're, we're in this environment that is just simply too strident. Uh, and I say generational because I really think it's my generation that's to blame. I really do believe that if you look at the, the millennials coming up, at least on social policy, they may argue about whether you should raise or lower taxes. Uh, they may even one day argue about whether you should go into foreign wars or not. But on social policy, on women's rights, on gay issues, um, th this debate has already been settled. 
and uh, as my generation reluctantly is, uh, leaves the stage, uh, you may see these wars actually calm down. So it may just be a question of time. Okay, we've got the line to Washington reestablished, which is a good thing because I know we've all been, as John Duffy would say, sitting on spilches here waiting for David Frum's joke. So mm -hmm. go ahead, Frum, <laughs> let's hear it. Lower the tone. Yeah. All right. Um, the story goes that General de Gaulle had a particularly brilliant aide, and a friend praised this aide and said, General, your, your aide, Colonel the Duke, he just, he's brilliant, he's so amazing, he knows everything. To which the general said, yes, it's true, he knows everything, but alas, he knows nothing else. Um, if the question is, how do smart people do in politics? Um, smart people can do very well. No one's smarter than Stephen Harper. The uh, current Foreign Secretary of, of Great Britain, William Hague, has written the definitive one-volume biography of uh, William Pitt, the great 18th century statesman. Uh, Karl Rove, no fool. Um, it is possible to bring, po uh, bring brains to bear in a powerful way, an effective way in politics. But you have to understand that politics is much more like art than it is like intellectual activity. And a great politician is much more like an artist. Um, the question, and the, the reason that Barack Obama has had so much trouble is not um, that he's got too much brain, it's that he's got too little emotional connection. He's, he's too cold, he's too austere. In this way, he's very reminiscent of Canada's Pierre Trudeau. Um, Pierre Trudeau um, was not smarter than other people, but there was a sort of a part of his heart and soul that was missing. Now, some people saw that as a tribute to his austere intellect, but it also meant he was, he was just disconnected from his society in important ways. Let me follow up on that with Sylvia Bashevkin because um yeah, this was the country that elected Pierre Trudeau, which makes some liberals today think that the country could be ready for an intellectual like Michael Ignatieff. Do you think that's true? I think it's possible, but I think to be fair to Trudeau, I think it was clear he had a passionate understanding of the issues he cared about. He had a very passionate commitment, for example, to keeping Quebec nationalism away from breaking up this country. And so I think he was able to communicate what he cared about on the issues he cared about. It's true that things he didn't care about, he was quite cerebral and detached and aloof about. Like the economy. Like the economy or <laughs> Western Canada's alienation. But what he cared about, he passionately pursued. I think it's the ability to translate that passion. I think Bill Clinton had that ability to take intelligence and, and passion and combine them. With Michael Ignatieff, it would appear that his summer uh, travels, nearly 40,000 kilometers of summer travels, has permitted him to come off that bus and appear to be a much more passionate, engaged Canadian. This may help, but when he's back in Ottawa in the House of Commons, we don't exactly know the extent to which he's going to keep that connection with the Canadians he met. It's way too easy for me to ask you a question about Michael Ignatieff, so I'm not going to, John. So I'm going to ask you about his predecessor, though, Stéphane Dion, <laughs> who was also proud to be called an intellectual once upon a time. I'm not sure Mr. Ignatieff wants to be called that anymore, but certainly Stéphane Dion uh, was proud of it. Now. He's from Quebec. Mr. Gnatif isn't. Does that make a difference in all of this? It does a little bit. Um, I think the figure of an uh, intellectuel engagé, of a public intellectual in politics, uh, someone who styles him or herself an intellectual and gets involved outside of the academy, is actually a fairly familiar figure in the public life of Quebec uh, in a way that's not the case in the rest of Canada and is not the case in the United States. Um, figures like that are, of course, extremely familiar in France, uh, in Germany, uh, and throughout Europe, where actually expertise tends to be valued a little bit more than the common man's common sense. Uh, the val high valuation on the common man's common sense is a hallmark of North American politics. Um, always has been and always will be. I think I just want to return, though, to something that's new here, and, and I think John Ibbotson touched on it. It's really very resonant for me. I think it's right. Um, with the democratization of the national conversation that changes in technology has brought about, you've got a huge clamor out there. The only way to be heard is through, in this environment, is through relentless simplification. The other thing is, I was talking to Alan Gregg, who is one of the deans of political thinking in this country and putting it in action the other day about this, and he said, you know, in a world of 50% turnouts, forget about persuading. The people you persuade stay at home. The ones you want to get to are the ones you can mobilize to show up. And we have a politics that's now all about mobilization and very little about persuasion. That's a forbidding environment for a come let's reason together intellectual and a very good environment for those who can relentlessly mobilize their base. John Ibbotson, you want to agree with that? Is it just this is no climate for anybody who's an intellectual and in fact if you prove your anti-intellectual chops or maybe even hate elites, you're better off? Well look, I, I agree with John on, on all of those points. 
But we also need to remember that it's, being an intellectual is not even necessarily a very good thing in politics. Um, sure, there are lots of intellectuals in, in continental Europe, but look what continental Europe got itself into in the 20th century. Uh, there <laughs> is something to be said for the kind of, of, of cold-hearted pragmatism that is the common man's common sense. I mean, one of the things that I found particularly offensive, and, and still find offensive, is uh, among the intellectual elites, the, the Laurentian consensus uh, that is the <clears throat> sort of the liberal agreement among a certain class of people in Montreal and Ottawa and Toronto about how the country ought to be run. A group of people who, by the way, get to run the country uh, much of the time. Their sense of outrage whenever one of their own kind isn't in power. Uh, I don't want to speak to the candidacy of, of, of Mr. Ford in, in Toronto, but you, you, you feel it about him, the sense not just of this man would not be a right person to be mayor of Toronto, but the, the, the sense of rage and fury that I remember in 1995 when Mike Harris became uh, Premier of Ontario. <clears throat> now, Mike Harris might not have gone to university, or at least he might never have graduated from it, but the man was very smart. It wasn't a question of whether he was smart or stupid, although his opponents did everything they could to make him seem stupid. It was that he was illegitimate. He was a golf pro from North Bay. He wasn't one of us. I remember seeing uh, an event at which uh, Bob Ray and David Peterson and Bill Davis had all been brought to a fundraiser. And I thought to myself and wrote, Mike Harris will never be invited to those fundraisers, not because he's a liberal or a conservative or NDP, because he's not one of us. That, I think, at a visceral level, remains <coughs> objectionable in Canadian, uh, Canadian and to some extent in American politics as well. He's uh, smart enough to be the only guy in 72 years to go from last place to first place in one election in the Ontario legislature. Uh, exactly. David Frum, I'm going to play a clip here from Michael Ignatiev from uh, 2005. This was a talk he gave, aware of the difference of being smart and being effective as a politician. Then I'm going to ask you to comment first. Roll tape, please. Part of the problem with the liberal blue states and this is just a parody, a parody at Harvard, we can't understand anything. We are so condescending about this president, we've been beaten twice by him, still can't figure out how he does it. Because we think he's stupid. He's anything but stupid. He's one of the best major league politicians anywhere. He has great natural connection with the public, Yes, he lost the debates, but you know what's smart, and it's a particular vice in the academy. We think that elections are debating contests. The American public is smart enough to know they're not electing the debating champ of the United States. <laughs> they're, de they're electing the president, right? They're not choosing verbal fluency. They're choosing character and decisiveness. A clip of the now liberal leader of Canada before he got into public life here in this country. David, of course, you were in that Bush White House. Uh, in your view, was Mr. Bush smart in a non-intellectual kind of way? Um, let me put it this way. I think he was certainly smarter than John Kerry was. Um, and I think there's a tendency to conflate intellect um, with a certain kind of style. Um, talking with a certain type of accent is not an indicator of IQ. IQ can be ramified through all kinds of accents. Um, and one of the things I think that is a real temptation to politicians, I always thought was striking about Al Gore. Um, Al Gore was not as intelligent as Bill Clinton, but it, Bill Clinton was not was intelligent enough that he didn't need everybody to think he was smart. He needed people to think he was president. Al Gore would rather have you think that he was smart than make him president. And I always thought he, that that was a sign actually of of his intellectual insecurity, which was uh, which, which was based on something. I want to pick up on something John Ibbotson said about that Laurentian consensus, and maybe this is um, this is a part of the story that should not be omitted when we ask a question like, why is Barack Obama in in so much trouble right now? Um, we also, in the United States, have seen a particular kind of consensus. It was a consensus about how stock markets should work, cons consensus about how financial markets should work. And it was a consensus that was shared by Democrats and Republicans from the middle 1990s until 2008. Bob Rubin was as much a part of the consensus as Phil Graham. Um, and that consensus broke down in ways that hurt a lot of people very, very badly. And Barack uh, Barack Obama was elected in part to set it right, um, to make the economy work again for ordinary people, and he has not succeeded in that. Um, the American economy has recovered in certain ways. We've seen the fastest increase in corporate profits since December 2008 ever recorded. Um, the banks are solvent again. They've paid back their TARP money. But personal income remains um, in terrible shape. Unemployment remains terrible. Home foreclosures continue at a rate of about a million a year. So if you ask why does the American voter uh, feel that 
this man whom they're told is so smart is somehow disconnected from them or that his intelligence is no use to them. There's some objective factors. It's not just a matter of style. Uh, Jonathan Alter, would you agree that Americans in particular at this moment, but maybe people all over the world, <clears throat> would prefer that their politicians not look too knowledgeable right now? That's not what no, I said. I think they like. Their, I know that's not what you said, I but I'm, I'm going there. Politicians knowledgeable. No, I think they want their politicians knowledgeable. Uh, brains helps. I, I actually agree with what David just said. I, you know, underlying all of this is the economy, and uh, it's much harder to get credit for preventing a depression, as Barack Obama did, than for get beginning to get us out of a depression, as Franklin Roosevelt did. Even though it took until the huge government spending of World War II before we were fully out of it. But the, you know, the point is that in a, if, if he was seen to be making more progress on the economy, he would not be in this kind of shape. So there are these objective conditions, if you will, that, that we shouldn't leave out of the conversation. But the framing of the issues and his ability to connect emotionally uh, it is still critical. And he's missing some component there. We know he's capable of it, but he hasn't been delivering, at least until very recently when he started to show some passion and fire on the campaign trail in Ohio. My own analysis is that he overlearned the famous dictum of uh, former New York Governor Mario Cuomo. Cuomo famously said, you campaign in poetry and govern in prose. So Obama campaigned in poetry, and then he figured, OK, I'm president now. I'm going to become very prosaic. I'm, I'm going to leave the emotion aside. That began with his inaugural address, which was designed to lower people's expectations. But it left them kind of disoriented. Who was this guy we thought he was inspirational, who we, we just elected? And he needs to understand that there are some qualities of campaigning that you want to have as part of governing. And, and it actually helps you govern if you maintain that emotional connection throughout your presidency. Let me pick up on that word connection with you, John Duffy, because I wonder if, if you're concerned about a potential disconnect here as it relates to Michael Ignatieff. This is a guy who's written, I don't know, what is it, I mean, 17, 18 books, something like that. He's a professor at Harvard University. He's one of the great intellectuals in the world, quite frankly. And yet, in order to be electable, the people in the Liberal Party decided that they had to send him on the road, put him in plaid shirts, don't let him get within a thousand miles of a Starbucks, make sure he's only seen a Tim Hortons. Thank you, Susan Delacourt, for that three-part series in a star. That was good stuff. Uh, they had to they're trying to turn him into something he clearly hasn't been. You have a problem with that? No, not really. Um, I don't think that's actually what they're doing. Um, I think, you know, look, they're trying to anti-intellectualize him as much as oh, they can. Oh, I don't think they're trying to make him anti-intellectual at all. I mean, I don't, listen, on the one hand, obviously, he's, he's in motion. Uh, I remember last spring he got lots of yaks at one of the, lots of yaks, excuse me, at one of these Laurentian consensus fundraisers that are so beloved of my friend John Ebbotson um, by saying that he has written more books than Stephen Harper has read. Ha ha, everybody sort of claps and says, yay, aren't we so smart and clever? Um, and that obviously wasn't working for him all that well. Uh, I think, obviously, the time that he spent on the road this summer has been in part an effort to get him out of Ottawa and get him into a slightly different and more relaxed setting. And I think what's key here is not whether he changes the brand of his coffee, and I don't think it is whether he puts on a pair of blue jeans as opposed to a pair of whatever gorgeous European tailored slacks he used to wear back in Harvard. I think what matters is actually getting him out of Ottawa. And this really goes to what I think I understood David Frum to be saying. Um, right now is not a good time to be an incumbent. It's not a good time to be a technocrat. It's not a very good time to be arguing that the experts know what they're doing. Um, the, the signs of wear and tear on the, 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 the solidity of intellectual consensus points that have governed public policy are overwhelming, from the economy to what people are experiencing with energy to what people are looking at in their retirement savings. A whole lot of basic assumptions are really starting to fray. And so I think being seen as an authority figure is dangerous right now, and being seen as an anti-incumbent is a great idea. And in a country where, in Canada at least, the distaste for our Parliament Hill is about as high as Americans' distaste for their Capitol Hill, mm -hmm. Um, getting off Capitol Hill, getting out of the Capitol, 
and being there with the folks is a very safe and warm place to be uh, and, 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 and good politics. Okay, um, but I'm going to come back at this with um, the principal here from University College because you said it doesn't matter if he changes his brand of coffee. And again, we learned in that Susan Delacour case. I said not as much as if he gets okay, out of it. Okay, but here's where I'm going. Stephen Harper, policy wonk, intellectual, whatever. Michael Ignatieff, definitely an intellectual. Neither one of them drinks coffee. They go to Timmy Ho's and they drink hot chocolate or they drink tea because they don't drink coffee, but they want to be seen as being, you know, men of the people. So are we at a politics right now in our political history where you can't really be who you are, you got to try to twist yourself into something you're not because of what's out there right now? Well, I think it is a struggle, Steve, and I think this, this notion of trying to appear genuine because people have lost trust, and there's a great deal of cynicism about individual politicians and about institutions and so on. So I think all in all, it's an effort by these uh, packagers in the parties to make re uh, you know, the leaders seem real. At the same time, though, as we've all been saying, we come back to this point about passion. We come back about the ability to communicate. And we've seen, in some cases, very successful, intelligent leaders take the ideas of other people and run with them and communicate them effectively. I think of Margaret Thatcher and the ideas of Sir Keith Joseph. I think of Tony Blair and other third-way leaders, including Clinton and Clay Chen, taking the ideas of, of Anthony Giddens. I mean, the point is we are hungry for ideas and we are hungry for solutions. And we are more likely, I suspect, to accept them when they're communicated with a combination of intellect and passion and when we believe that they're coming from people who genuinely believe in those ideas themselves. And it's that connect, I think, that we will soon see if, for example, Michael Ignatieff can bring himself as an opposition leader to get Canadians excited about a future that we're going to believe in that he can lead us towards. Let me go back to uh, Jonathan Alter on this one because uh, you, you've had, I guess the expression is more face time with Barack Obama than anybody around this table today. And the, the word you keep hearing about Mr. Obama is that he is emotionally aloof, which I wonder if that's code word for intellectual. Does he does he want to be intellectually aloof, excuse me, does he, does he want to be emotionally aloof or is that who he really is? Is that who he is or is that what he thinks he has to be? Uh, I think it's who he really is. Um, it, it's different than aloof. You don't get the feeling when you're with him that he's a cold individual. He's not a haughty or intellectually pretentious individual in any way, um, but he is detached. And he always is, there's always a little bit of distance between him and whoever he's talking to. Uh, and I generally don't think that's a problem. Um, one of his closest advisors described him to me as the most unsentimental man I've ever met. And he wasn't talking about him, you know, in terms of his family. He's very sentimental about them and he'll, you know, he'll cry uh, at, at various events. Um, but on the job, he's a, a, a hyper uh, rationalist and you know and that's generally very useful for problem solving if you're drilling down into to take the BP oil spill into you know how do we get them to assume 20 billion liability which he was able to do there's a whole it's like a problem set and he will do it in a very methodical way that strips emotion out of the equation as well it should be. The problem is he then fails to re-inject the emotion in some of the public parts of his job. And I think that's where, that's where he's got problems because there was a, a terrific comment made earlier in this discussion that uh, if you're trying to bring your base out, uh, it's not about persuasion. Uh, it, it, it's, you need emotion to motivate. You can use reason to persuade but you need emotion to motivate people to march. You know, they used to say about uh, Demosthenes, when, when another Greek uh, yeah. would speak, everybody would say, oh, yes, very, very intelligent. When Demosthenes spoke, we marched. And that, that's what you need in a, in a truly effective uh, leader. It's, as a, as a non-Canadian, it's stunning to me that Ignatiev, who I have great respect for, that he could even be in the game uh, after having not lived in the country for 30 years. You know, in the United States, if you lack that kind of connection, it, 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 it would be completely uh, implausible. So we have even more common man, common woman demands 
on our politicians uh, than you do in Canada. Now, David Frum, I should get you to follow up on that, because the, the fact is Mr. Gatti did live out of the country for a long time, and yet the latest public opinion poll shows him tied with the prime minister, who's lived here his whole life, and until he became prime minister, really hadn't seen that much of the world. So what do you want to infer from that? What does it say about well, us? Can, can, can Canadians are a very mobile people. There's a huge inflow of population into the country, um, and Canadians work ab abroad. It's just the difference in having a, a relatively small in population terms country versus a, a huge world like the United States. I didn't know John Duffy's story about uh, uh, Michael Ignatieff actually saying that he had written more books than Stephen Harper had read. If that's true, I blush for him. Um, and I, I would also, if I were liberal, tremble for him, because one of the big mistakes you can make is to um, underestimate your opponents. And if his operating theory is that Stephen Harper is not at least as smart as he is, and probably quite a bit sharper, actually, um, he's going to be heading for that, um, uh, those sets of rotating knives. Uh, one of the things that has been a weakness through this conversation is that we often are conflating status markers for intellectual markers. Buying your coffee at Starbucks doesn't make you better informed. It doesn't make you more intelligent. It just means you have an extra few bucks to spend on the product. The same thing with the pants. Um, a sharp pair of pants is not necessarily an indicator of better knowledge, better awareness, more intellect uh, than a plaid shirt. Those are status markers that, that indicate what you have to spend, not what you know. Um, there is, I think, tremendous openness um, to people who are knowledgeable, um, who, uh, I mean, it's obviously a huge advantage in politics to be smart, and it's a big disadvantage to be dumb. You make mistakes. Um, and there are a lot of American politicians um, who are briefly, who are, 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 are famous in the moment, the Michelle Bachmans, uh, they have a good three months, but they will make a mistake and it will be a wrecker. Um, and the, the clever ones avoid that, as Bill Clinton, um, I mean, he made a lot of mistakes and he managed to avoid uh, the consequences of, of every one of them. But you have to, you have to remember who you're working for. Uh, you have to remember why you're in politics. You are not in politics to make a point, and you're not in politics to play with ideas. Uh, you're in politics to s serve the welfare of the people who elect you. And people are very good at detecting who's got their own agenda and who's got an agenda of public service. Uh, there's a lot for John Duffy to want to take on there, but I should give you a chance to respond to some of that. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm just really struck. I think David's dead bang right about, <clears throat> about status markers. And, you know, there is an enormous divide in our society between people who have a college education and people who do not. Um, that is, by, by every indicator, the big the big cleavage on income, it drives a whole lot of life chances and it's, it's, it's something that's an enormous problem and has to be worked through. Getting on the wrong side of that divide or accentuating that divide automatically narrows your appeal one way or another. Um, I would no more recommend telling smug intellectual jokes and certainly, you know, I'm, I'm glad my leader in, of my party is going to be doing less of that, I believe, than I'd recommend ostentatiously dropping your G's or your H's in order to appeal to the vote in Putney or in Glasgow or, Which or, Obama or, does. or wherever. Well, um, I think it's a bit unauthentic and a little bit dangerous. The, the thing that strikes me, though, is when I was initially thinking about this problem for this show, I thought back to Jack Kennedy. And Jack Kennedy deliberately styled himself as an intellectual. And that wasn't just because of who he was, because he genuinely loved ideas and he was very passionate about them. It's also because that was a good thing to be seen as back then. I think you can track, uh, as part of this conversation, the decline of the North American intelligentsia's fortunes as a class. I don't think they're as influential as they, are, as they used to be, certainly not as much as they want to be. I think they've come down in the world. I don't think, for example, Barack Obama really hitched his wagon to being an intellectual as he was a rising aspirant in American society coming from a marginal position. As a Hawaiian-born uh, black man uh, of mixed African and American parentage, I don't think he made himself into being a, a, a intellectual in the way that Kennedy, an immigrant's son, did. I think Obama invented himself as a man of the people and a community organizer. It tells you something about where the class aspirations of Americans have shifted to in the 50 years since JFK uh, was prominent on the scene. Jonathan Alter, you look like you want in on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I guess I don't fully agree, uh, and not just because uh, Joseph Kennedy, uh, JFK's father, wasn't himself an immigrant. Uh, Obama uh, did not talk about Harvard publicly on television during the campaign, uh, going to Harvard Law School and being the first African-American African editor of the Harvard Law Review, which is a tremendously prestigious position within the American intelligentsia. But he talked about it, uh, or it was talked about and associated with him all the time in private when he was ascending very rapidly within uh, the Democratic Party. It was extraordinarily important 
uh, for his early fundraising, that he have this intellectual pedigree. He never would have made it as far as he did without it. Uh, so it's, it's a, almost like a dual system. You can't be seen publicly uh, on television a, a, as a Harvard man, uh, but you want, you want that imprimatur. And I don't think it's all that much different than it was uh, in JFK's day. He did not campaign uh, in 1960 as a, as a Harvard guy. Let me read a quote here, which I suspect, John Ibbotson, you read in the original New Yorker piece that Adam Gopnik did on the liberal leader of Canada. I'll just share this quote with our viewers and then get you to comment. I had always been impressed by his gravity and his intelligence, but he had never struck me as a natural politician, the kind of homo Clintonius who feels the need to woo and win every table. Retiring and precise, professorial in demeanor, he had a vibe of virtue rather than of ambition. John, do you think Ignatiev is learning to be appropriately ambitious now? Well, I think he's trying to learn to be appropriately ambitious. I'd, I'd, make, <clears throat> I'd make a couple of points here. The first is that it's uh, Michael Ignatiev who has started to wear plaid shirts and who drops his G's uh, at every occasion. Stephen Harper doesn't drop his G's, and Stephen Harper doesn't go out on bus tours. Now, he is the prime minister, but he has never attempted any kind of populist appeal. He is a cerebral man. He is emotionally cold. He is an introvert, in fact. Uh, anyone who's close to him knows that, and every Canadian knows it, too. And yet, uh, he gets the job done, at least in the opinion of a minority of people. I think two things are happening which, that, that, that are going to make the next election at the federal level absolutely fascinating. The first is, yes, there's an anger out there. I think in some sense it is 1995 again. Uh, the lower middle class is hurting. It doesn't feel confident uh, that <clears throat> anyone is looking out for it, and it's getting mad. And that, mad, that anger is starting to show up in some election campaigns, including the Merrillty campaign in Toronto. The second thing is we haven't had an issues election at the federal level since 1988. Every election since 1988, <coughs> excuse me, has been about who do you trust. The, the agendas of the conservative and liberal parties <coughs> have been essentially the same. This election will be different. This election is going to be an ideas election. The, 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 the government, I suspect, will fall over the budget and the, and the conservatives will campaign on we have to cut the deficit and we have to keep taxes down and that means we have to cut spending. And the Liberals are going to campaign on, we have to look out for people, we have to protect spending in important areas, we may have to keep taxes a bit higher, and we may have to defer deficit reduction. That's going to be the first actual ideas election that we've had in more than 20 years. And then we'll see uh, the role of ideas and of smart people in politics. For more on that 1988 election, please consult Fights of Our Lives, written by John Duffy some years <coughs> ago. Excellent book on this thing. So if you're a person, Sylvia, of some intellectual gravitas, let's put it that way, and you want to make a contribution in public life, would you be wise to just run as fast as you can for the hills right now or have somebody beat that thought right out of your head? This is just seems like a very scary time to be an intellectual in public life. I think it's actually a time of opportunity. How so? I mean, I think it's a time of opportunity. I mean, we see a president of the United States who comes from an extraordinarily different background from any other previous presidents, uh, trying to, you know, make a difference in a world that certainly needs mm. Uh, improvement. But as Jonathan told us, not playing up his intellectual no, but, CV. But the point is, a lot of uh, the intelligence I think that political leaders have is the interpersonal intelligence that we haven't talked much about, right? It's that emotional piece. It's the ability to keep a team together. It's the ability to inspire a political party. It's the ability to communicate uh, via the media, which is the, uh, re you know, representing ideas to the public. So I think it is a time, in fact, when we do need more bright people who have the ability to work with others and communicate with passion a genuine sense of how to build our economy, how to make Canadians uh, believe that our democracy can work. I mean, that's one thing the leader of the official opposition found on his trips, was actually Canadians are very worried about the fabric uh, of our democracy and how it's frayed over, over the years. So I think it is an, uh, an opportune time, and I'm happy to say, uh, that there are many young students who appear to be very interested now, not just in extra parliamentary politics, but finally again in parties and legislatures and running for office. And they take classes from you? You've seen them, eh? I've seen them. I've seen them. I've okay. been privileged to meet them. Okay. Uh, David Frum, I want you to give us a real life example of what we're talking about here. And I, I want to talk about Bill Clinton, Homo Clintonius, as he was called in that, yeah. in that quote. Uh, my hunch is you didn't vote for Bill Clinton either time. 
Uh, Bill Clinton is yeah. uh, I mean, he's a Rhodes Scholar, so the guy's got some intellectual ability, obviously, but certainly if you ask people to give their, definite, their, their first adjective that comes to mind about Bill Clinton would not be intellectual. But tell us how you experienced him for the first time during the 1991 Democratic presidential primaries. He, uh, look, Bill Clinton is as smart as anybody who has ever done anything. I mean, you just think how many different stories he told how many different people and how he kept track of every one of them. He had a mind <laughs> like a supercomputer <laughs> tracking ICBMs. Um, uh, uh, and people were amazed by that. In the early coverage of him, it was his intellect that drew people. But it was also, it was united to this lust for life um, and this ability to make emotional connections. Look, when David Petraeus, if David Petraeus runs for president in 2016, it will not be a negative factor about him uh, that he has a PhD from Princeton. It will be a positive factor. Uh, but it will be a positive factor because it occurs within the context of a military career. Why is that so important? Why do those two things then go so well together? Um, and you have to look at the institutions that Americans trust and that people in other democracies trust. In the United States, the military symbolizes, I think, three things that are different from civilian elites. It symbolizes success. The military is good at what it does, and after the wreck of the financial markets, the civilian elites don't look good at what it does. It represents service. The people who rise to the top have actually have literally put their lives on the line. Other people seem to be feathering their nests and bent on their own advantage. And the military is an institution that works for lower middle class America, for the bottom half of society, pulls people up and gives them a chance, which it looks like the civilian institutions have not done so well um, over the past while. Now, if you're in that context, if that's who you are, what you've done, then and you have a PhD from Princeton, good for you. But if you are in a context where people think you're self-aggrandizing, you're not about service, um, and uh, where you are not sensitive to the aspirations of most of the society, um, then your fancy educational decree just becomes one more of those offensive status markers. Jonathan, that would be a change, I guess, from uh, the kind of presidents your country has had for 16 of the last almost 18 years now, where two Clinton terms and two George W. Bush terms, uh, these were both guys who kind of dodged the draft and still managed to become president. So I guess the yardsticks have moved, is that right? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I actually quite agree with what David just said, that it, it would be a potent combination. But before uh, conservatives in the audience get excited, um, you know, I had a conversation with General Petraeus at one point uh, about his possibly being a candidate. and. He said, what part of no don't you understand? <laughs> and I said, General, are you being Shermanesque, which is a reference to the Civil War General William Tecumseh Sherman, who said, if nominated, I will not run. If elected, I will not serve. And I said, General, are you being Shermanesque? And he said, yes, I am being Shermanesque. So I think he's a kind of a, a fantasy of the right at this point. They're going to have to find another candidate, although... As David points out, uh, it would be a powerful combination were he to to run. Although, you know, I saw him on uh, a comedy show that my wife works for, The Colbert Report, uh, recently. And it was great that they had him on, but he was very, very stiff in, uh, in you know, appearing on that show. So there, there are a lot of different skills that go in to being a, a politician. One very quick note about Stephen Harper, I did find in, in doing my research uh, for the promise that uh, President Obama quite likes his, uh, encounter, his encounters with Stephen Harper, and they have uh, what Obama's aides describe as a, an especially good relationship, one of the better ones that he has uh, with other foreign leaders, some of the press notwithstanding. I know nobody will believe this, but Stephen Harper, in small groups, away from television cameras, one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two, is a very charming, funny guy. Uh, John Ibbotson, I see you nodding your head. Have you experienced that yourself? Yes, in fact, uh, just a couple of weeks ago when I was with him on the Arctic trip and we got uh, stuck in Churchill, Manitoba during a raging storm. So he had <clears throat> something that he very rarely does. We had an off-the-record lunch. And he is uh, a, a smart, engaging man. And it is not surprising that he and Barack Obama, and we've heard the same thing up here, that he and the American president get on particularly well. Um, the two men are policy walks. The two men like to bat around ideas. Um, and in the better angels of Stephen Harper's nature, and those angels are quite often not present, um, he shares with Obama the desire to work pragmatically through to uh, politically realizable and practically achievable solutions. Uh, and, and probably his better angels are out when he's with, with the prime minister. <laughs> Other days, of course, not so much. We've got less than 10 minutes to go here, and I want to try this. John Duffy, to you first. Is it, is it a problem with intellectually minded politicians that they are so mindful 
of their place in history, that they are trying to leave too big an intellectual, uh, too big a historical footprint. Have you seen that? I, w wow, that's a, <laughs> I'm not smart enough to answer that one fast. Oh, yes, you okay. are. Yes, you are. It's a I, good I, question. It is a terrific question. I think it belongs more to, to depth psychology uh, and the historical record than to where my experience lives, which is mostly working with these people uh, in a flesh and blood kind of way. Um, if you talk to them, and it doesn't matter whether they're highly educated and very bookish or whether they're much more plain spoken and, and maybe come from a, a, a different place in our society or geographically than the, than the, than the high status course. Um, one way or another, very few of them I've ever met spend much time thinking about their legacy. Is that right? Because um, we don't believe that. Well, we believe that's all they're worried about. <laughs> well, the truth <laughs> is, I think between getting power, using power, and retaining power, most of their hard drive is pretty occupied most of the time, thinking what the future will look like, uh, how their use of power will, will appear in the future, is something that they may do in the watches of the night, but that's long after guys like me have been sent home to go off and, 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 uh, and live our lives. Uh, I wouldn't want to second guess them. That's much more, you know, for Jonathan Alter, who who actually writes brilliantly and evocatively about what goes on in these people's Let's souls. Let's get Jonathan and then Sylvia on that as well. Go ahead, yeah. Jonathan. Yeah, you're too kind. I, I guess I don't agree. I, I think most of them uh, are re, are legacy obsessed, <laughs> and they might not talk to their aides too much about it, and they certainly don't like to talk publicly about it. But you can read between the lines of a lot of things that they say, and this apply, you know. Uh, Bill Clinton um, was very focused on this. George W. Bush claimed not to be, but there were a lot of signs that, that he was very interested in what his legacy would be. And I think, um, you know, Obama's already thinking about it. It's one of the reasons why he's focused on education. He feels like that will, even though it doesn't get a lot of attention, uh, it will be a, a, an important legacy uh, issue for him. Um, and it's why He's been willing to suffer the political consequences uh, of dealing with Congress, which everybody hates, because he knows that so much of his legacy will be dependent on which bills he was able to get through Congress. So well, I, yes. let, oh, me just, let me just say that, that clearly my cynical reporter friend from Capitol Hill has to come up here from Canada and spend some time <laughs> in Canada where politicians are still legacy free and constantly thinking about the public. <laughs> here, here. Yeah. Love to have you here, John. I think there's one dimension, Steve, of wisdom. Uh, that speaks to uh, a strategic mindfulness. And I think that uh, many uh, successful politicians who've merged passion and intellect have had that strategic vision. I think of Trudeau on Quebec nationalism and the charter. I think of Mulroney on free trade. I think of uh, Margaret Thatcher and her views about rebuilding Britain in, in a more market as opposed to state-oriented way. I mean, I think each of them has had a big idea and they have focused really relentlessly on bringing it forward. I think it was with an eye towards that legacy, and I think we've seen as well the inability of some of our political leaders to keep that strategic focus. I refer, for example, to the very bright Paul Martin, um, because I think the inability to keep focused on a small number of priorities speaks to the lack of the strategic wisdom that makes a great leader and a great intellect actually have a great legacy. Most people thought he was a brilliant guy, but of course, I, I agree. Didn't hang well, around long I enough. agree. I also think that his focus and success on the deficit reduction effort is going to go down as his crowning achievement, That's a, which, as a which, would tend to, which would tend to support Sylvia's yes, as, as, as a finance, finance minister. finance minister, yes. Okay, David Frum, let me get you on the same question. Are, are intellectually minded politicians, uh, I guess, uh, hamstrung by wanting to leave too big a historical footprint? Um, any politician is hamstrung if they uh, succumb to illusions about how much control they have over destiny, and they lose humility and patience. Um, Abraham Lincoln, who by all acknowledgments is a pretty profound man, his law partner said of Lincoln that, that uh, Lincoln read less and thought more than anyone he had ever met. Um, and Lincoln, when he summed up his presidency, said, um, I freely confess that I never controlled events. Events controlled me. Hmm. Um, I think a politician who is honest with himself will say, or herself, 
that their success depends on being able to master the currents of time, impose some shape on events, but understand that you, you don't make the events. The events make you. Barack Obama did not, um, did not choose to come into politics at a time of financial crisis. It's not the thing he um, is interested in. Uh, you can read through all of his many um, wor words, many, many words. Uh, there's very little about finance in them. He says that's not a subject that mattered to him. In fact, the larger economy didn't matter to him. That's what he was given. George Bush was really interested in domestic policy, not foreign affairs. Affairs. He was given 9-11 and had to make sense of that. Um, and these leaders, Canadian leaders who are given financial crisis or financial opportunity, um, Pierre Trudeau inheriting prosperity, leaving economic uh, chaos behind him, um, that these leaders each have the problem of their time and they have to do it as best they can. And if they're constantly checking themselves in the mirror, well, they're cheating the boss. They're not putting their mind fully to the job. John Ibbotson, how would you answer that? I think Stephen Harper in particular, because he's the one we're looking at here right now, is starting to think about legacy. I think there are signs of it. I think his first, the, the first thing that he wanted to do, maybe the only thing he really wanted to do, apart from managing the store well, was to create a conservative party uh, that would not be perpetually on the brink of disintegration. Um, and he appears to have achieved that. But I think we're also seeing him look around for something else. And I think we're beginning to get hints of it, which is, and this is going to sound like pretty small potatoes for some people, but hey, this is Canada and this is Ottawa, um, the, a role for the federal government as a regulator in the country. Ottawa has given away so many powers to the provinces that there's a great question as to what is it exactly that the federal government does now. And we see in legislation to create a national securities regulator and in other legislation as well to impose some kind of vision on the country in which Ottawa is the place that coordinates and that regulates. I think we see it as well in the Arctic, his desire to project Canadian force and Canadian uh, diplomatic presence up there. I think I see in some of this a man who's looking around for something to leave behind. Hmm. John Duffy, you know uh, Jean Chrétien a little bit. Mm -hmm. When you talk about legacy, it's impossible for me to believe that at some point when he looked at himself in the mirror, he didn't think, I won three consecutive majorities and Mr. Trudeau never did. I mean, that has to have crossed his mind, don't you think? Well, I imagine that. Um, <laughs> Mr. Kretchen be competitive with one of his great predecessors. There you go. As he is with everybody. And, and his successor, Including himself. Sure. I mean, yeah. uh, I don't have a problem thinking about that, but do, do uh, you know, in believing that. Um, but I know from, you know, when you're dealing with things, I, I, I think what David Frum said is really right. When you're, when you're in there, and Mr. Kretchen has described politics as much more like playing goalie than playing, you know, a forward. I mean, you're sitting there, pucks are flying in at you constantly. You are a prisoner of events. You're having to react. You're having to deal with things. Um, there may be a little bit of time uh, at the end of the day to think about how it's all going to look after it's all over. Um, but I don't think it's what you think of. And, you know, Jonathan Alter is right that people do think about how they look. They think about how it appears. They might spend some time thinking about how it will appear to future generations. But I think if, if I'm, I'm with those around the table who are saying mostly they're playing defense because, um, you know, as, as, as Fernand Braudel said, I'll make a terribly intellectual point, <laughs> quoting a dead French historian, you know, men do not make history. They are made by history. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's a very true and profound point that, uh, that intellectuals like Braudel made and intellectuals like David Frum are backing up today. And intellectuals like John Duffy now could never possibly run for office because they're quoting intellectuals from France. Certainement jamais. Absolument <laughs> impossible. Okay, can I thank everybody for joining us on the program today. David Frum, publisher of the FrumForum.com. David, thanks so much for joining us in Washington, thank as you. always. Jonathan Alter, author of The Promise, out of our New York City studio. Jonathan, terrific book. Really appreciated uh, your work on that. In our nation's Thanks capital, John Ibbotson from the Globe and Mail. John, as you know, pound for pound, I think you're the best columnist in the country. <laughs> and here in our studios, Sylvia Bashevkin, the principal at University College, University of Toronto. John Duffy, author of Fights of Our Lives, principal at the government relations firm Strategy Corp. Thanks, everybody.